Hello, everyone. Welcome to Megger's monthly webinar series. Today's topic is understanding the recommended practices of load testing. In this session, we'll be discussing the differences between IEEE and NIDA battery testing recommendations and the elements to consider when designing a test program. My name is Yer To, and I'm the marketing communications engineer for Mega North America. And I'll be acting as the moderator for today's presentation. I'll be supporting you on any technical issues or questions for our presenter during the session. On the right-hand side of your screen, you will see a control panel that looks similar to this one. You can submit questions at any time during the presentation by typing in the box highlighted in red, and I will read the questions out during the Q&A segment. You will receive a copy of the presentation afterwards and a link to the recorded session if you want to watch it again or share it with your colleagues. Remember, you can ask questions at any time during the presentation, and I will interject them as we have time. Our presenter today is Damien Robinson, Mega Southwest Regional Sales Manager. Damien is based out of Austin, Texas. Thank you for joining us, Damien. Thank you, Year. And thank you for everyone who's attending. I will say that, uh, as Year mentioned, I'm a regional sales manager. Um, <clears throat> I hope to be able to answer all the questions that are presented. I do want to preface that I am a bit more of a generalist for Megger, so batteries are not my uh, exact specialty, but I do have a, a good knowledge on it. If there's something that I don't know, I promise that I will take those questions and and give them pro provide them back in a written format. Okay, so our agenda for today. The first thing we're going to do is a brief review of the purpose of a battery. Uh, the two technologies that we're going to be discussing are the VLA or Venice lead acid and the valve regulated lead acid batteries, which are the majority of the batteries out there. And the common tests that are performed on batteries. We will then go into the IEEE capacity test recommendations, the different types of tests we'll do, and, and how, those, how, how you use those to design the test. Uh, the effects that we need to consider when when we're performing the different tests. Then we'll do a quick review of what the results will look like provided by the Mega solution, and just do a quick review of the NERC recommendations and compare those to what IEEE recommends. So with that, the purpose of a battery is obviously to support a load uh, based on a loss of a power or as part of a protection system such as opening a circuit breaker. Now, when we look at a battery, we're always provided what kind of load it would support based on a rating of ampere hours. Batteries, you have to, it depends which kind you select, but they're uh, rated at a certain amount of current for a specified amount of time. So, for example, a 120 amp hour battery could be 15 amps by eight out uh, by eight hours, and that is at 77 degrees Fahrenheit or 25 degrees C. They also battery manufacturers also provide that specification. Now, one thing to point out, and we'll see some examples later, is that this is not a linear function. So, I can't take half the time, say four hours, and get 30 amps. It doesn't work that way. The, the, amp hour, the amps actually decrease when I decrease the amount of time, or they proportionally decrease, I should say. Now, the again, the VLA is vented lead acid battery. The VRLA is a valve regulated lead acid battery. You can always, uh, vented lead acids are also called flooded cells or wet cells. You can always tell the difference in, between those and valve regulated because they will have the tank where, or the jar where you can actually see through it, like these here. And then the valve regulated, they're called, also called sealed or maintenance free which they are not truly sealed and not truly maintenance free, <clears throat> but they're just containers you won't be able to see through uh, to, to be able to see the plates. They're both going to be some sort of lead alloy base or pure lead, um, and then there are some, but the, there, there are some differences uh, such as 
the flooded cells, you obviously have liquid in it, and then the valve regulator, there's going to be some sort of absorbed glass mat or like a gel cell. Now, some of the similarities and differences. Now, I, I obviously these are not necessarily all of the similarity, similarities or all of the differences, and nor nor is this intended to indicate to you what specific battery you need for your application. But just some that I wanted to point out, you're going to have a similar construction between the two with the plates being a grid base with an al uh, based on some sort of alloy, lead alloy, and a paste material. <clears throat> As well, they're both going to be using sulfuric acid with our uh, formula of how they operate down below, where the lead is going to be my negative plate, the lead lead oxide is going to be my positive plate, and then I'm going to have some sort of sulfuric acid, and obviously this is in the charged state. And then in the discharge state, both of my plates are going to become sulfated, they're going to become lead sulfate, and then I'm going to get some water. <clears throat> now, the difference is, is going to be size. The vented lead acid is, is going to always proportionally be bigger than a valve regulated lead acid battery. Um, the general stability in life, vented lead acid batteries generally are more stable and generally you get a longer life life span out of them given the approximate same conditions. The electrolyte level is also a little bit different. Valve regulated tends to be a little bit higher. A higher, uh, uh, a higher electrolyte level measured as in terms of specific gravity typically means that you're going to get a higher power out of the battery or higher voltage. Um, as well, the recombination rate of oxygen and hydrogen. And basically that means how much of the oxygen and hydrogen is remaining, whether you're going from charge or discharge, how much of it is remaining within the battery and how much is being vented out. You'll see that the VL, the vented lead acid batteries or your flooded cells, they don't, they're not quite as efficient, so they're constantly leaking um, this oxygen and hydrogen, where the valve regulated lead acid, they, they have a lot better efficiency. One other difference that I did not put on here is the separator is different. The vented lead acid batteries use a microporous um, uh, material so that you have a good electrolyte and gas flow inside of the battery, whereas a valve regulated, for example, might use absorbed glass mat where the acid is fully absorbed into that glass mat material, and that, that glass mat must maintain contact with the plates of the battery. <clears throat> okay, some of the common tests, you have monthly and quarterly, quarterly and annual uh, tests, and this is specifically for the vented lead acid battery uh, based on IEEE standard 450-2010. You'll see that on the monthly basis you're going to be some, doing some of your voltage checks, charger output, uh, your specific gravity measurements on pilot cells and things of that nature, checking for grounds. Then you get into quarterly, you're doing more of more cells with regards to temperature and specific gravity and, and you're going to do more all of your cell voltages and then when you get on an annual basis now you're look, doing the specific gravi gravity of every cell, your strap resistances, the battery rack integrity and uh, we'll talk more about cell ohmic values in another couple slides but <clears throat> this is one, it's, it's optional which is interesting to me for this specific um, type of battery but uh, it's one that it can can be a lot of value, so it's one that I do highly rec recommend. Now, all of these tests are to assure that the batteries are, are going to be in good operating condition and that you'll have the best chance of getting the maximum amount of life out of them as well as the safe operation of the batteries. Now, when we switch over to the valve regulated lead acid, this is what's in the IEEE standard 1188 dash. 2005. Uh, you'll notice that on a monthly basis there's less items for me to do. Um, the, the visual is still there, the float voltage, charger output, temperature, ventilation, all those things are still there. But I don't have the specific gravities because 
I can't get access to the battery, um, to the to the electrolyte within the battery. So all of those are gone away. But you'll also notice that the grounds are gone away, um, the unintentional grounds. However, it is stated as part of the precautions uh, within the standard that you are to verify the voltage to ground before you begin any work. So if, if you follow the standard, you're still going to notice if there's any un unintentional grounds by doing that test as well. Typically, these uh, chargers are going to have some sort of ground fault indicator in them as well. <clears throat> on a now, you'll notice also on the cord uh, with regards to the cell ohmic values, they now move from the annual column, and they're now they're no longer optional. They're now in the quarterly co column, and they're no longer optional. That goes back to a statement I mentioned earlier that generally speaking, valve regulated lead acid batteries are not as stable as your vented lead acid batteries, and so these cell ohmic values become a very valuable trending tool for you. <clears throat> now there's a couple uh, terms I want to introduce you. you may be familiar with these if you uh, attended one of our previous battery seminars, but we talk about state of charge, and that's an indication of, of the battery's charge level. The two main measurements that you can, that people use for that are voltage or specific gravity. And if we take a look on the right-hand side where I have my D battery, C battery, AA, and AAA batteries, if I were to take a voltmeter across all of them, I'm going to measure one and a half volts. But obviously the ampere rating is, is different for each one of them. As I go up in size, I'm, I'm getting more capacity out of them. However, but a state of charge doesn't tell me necessarily that what my capacity is. So there's also state of health. Now, this is an indication of the battery's overall health, and it cor correlates to, to load. The, the value that we typically use in, in the, for these measurements is my cell ohmic values. And the trend, how they relate, is that as my ohmic value goes up, my capacity or amp hour rating tends to decrease. And I have a couple of pictures there of our battery impedance test products called the Byte series that we use for that measurement. Now this specific test, it is a trending test and some of the things that you'll want to do, this is just a sample of a, of a table that you'll use where you can check the averages of say a flooded cell versus a, uh, a, an individual cell versus the string average. Um, an individual cell versus the last test date, so how much did it change from 2015 to 2017, and then how much has changed versus, say, the baseline. So at some point, I'm going to I'm going to reach my minimum value, and then it's going to trend up from that point. And how much has it changed from that? And that could have been five years ago, six years ago, ten years ago that I that I received that value. And what you'll see on a trend, if I, on my x-axis, I have the percent of battery life versus the percent impedance change, and I have three different conditions that can occur. The blue trace being a normal cell that it starts out a little, all of them start out a little bit high, they'll fully form and come into of some low value, and so right here where kind of my laser is, that would be considered my baseline. And then normally, under regular conditions, they should remain fairly stable, but slightly increasing up until a point where you get, you know, towards 60, 70, 80 percent, and then they start taking off, trending towards an open cell under normal conditions. A, a weak cell would, would follow that same pattern, but they would just fail a lot quicker. And then some sort of abnormal cell where you might be having excessive sulfation, it will trend downward. In other words, it's trending towards a sort, which is not, that's not the normal process a battery takes. Now, I mentioned that this type of test, it's a trending test as my home value goes up, my percent my uh, capacity goes down, but if I have a ohm value that increases 10%, I 
I know that my amp hour rate decreased, but I don't know to, to what degree. So the only solution to this problem is to do a capacity test. So when we look at the IEEE capacity rec test recommendations, there are four types. There's an acceptance test, performance test, a service test, and a modified performance test. Now, it should be noted that the modified performance test is only recognized for the vented lead acid batteries in the IEEE 450 standard. It is not recognized for the valve regulated lead acid, only the accepted performance and service tests are. <clears throat> now, the general purpose, and we'll get into these in more detail, but the general purpose is the acceptance and performance are to determine the capacity of the battery. The service test is to verify the battery's ability to meet its duty cycle. In other words, what, it was the, what the engineer designed it to, to, to the load that it was designed to carry for the specified amount of times. Now, the modified performance test is to determine capacity, and it's also to verify the ability to meet the critical part of, of its duty cycle. And we'll get into that more in a few slides. The acceptance test is made at the beginning of the life of the battery when it's, when it's brand new. Typically, it's going to be done upon installation or possibly even at the manufacturer's site. Um, this test is usually done on a constant current, although you can use constant power as well. It's just generally easier for uh, whatever instruments you're using to do, to do a constant current, so people tend to, uh, to gravitate towards that. There are some tests that you're typically going to do uh, with all of these, really. You're going to monitor your voltages, your electrolyte levels, and specific gravity prior to doing any sort of test. This test is going to be considered successful if every cell is at least 90% of what the manufacturer designed its capacity to be. Um, there Now, after this test, you'll do an... Uh, performance test, which we'll get into the next slide, and you, you, it might be noted that the performance test lasts longer than this first acceptance test. Um, as I mentioned, it, it's, this is considered passing at 90%, whereas you'll go to the next test and it could be 100 uh, if, to reach that 100% capacity design. A performance test is much like an acceptance test. Um, it's a constant current or constant power test. Um, but this is made after the battery has been in service for some period of time, typically two years. <clears throat> it's, it's recommended, according to the IEEE, to do this test to, to make sure that your duration is similar to that of the duty cycle. <clears throat> and you'll want to do these on a continuous basis, and we'll get into the frequency in, uh, in, in a few slides, what the recommended frequencies are. Now, the service test, as I mentioned, is going to be based on the ability for the battery to meet its load. In other words, what, what it was designed to carry for the amount of time it's designed to carry, you're testing exactly to those specifications. Now, one of the differences with this particular test is it's done in an as-found condition. So we're not going to equalize the batteries prior to the test. <clears throat> Um, the other important thing, we haven't talked about the effects of temperature or age yet. We will get to that, but you will not correct the, you will not do this test and correct for temperature or age. It's completely in an as found condition. The modified performance test is also a test in the as found condition. Now, it's, it has a twofold uh, process where you're going to do combination of the high rate, the highest rate typically shown for for what it's designed or for its duty cycle, as well as the duration, the full duration, the full capacity or the full load that I need to get out of this, that I need to support with this battery. So we're going to confirm both the critical period of the low duty cycle as well as what the percentage rating of the capacity is. Um, the, this 
can be done in lieu of a service test or a performance test at any time, and it's considered passing if it has a rated capacity of 80% or greater. Now the frequency, as I mentioned, yes, yes. Before we move on, I uh, have a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, sure. So if you are continuously monitoring and trending the, the cell omic value, then how often should you perform a capacity test? If if you're monitoring the cell only, repeat the question. Omic value. If you're continuously monitoring and trending the omic value, then how often should you perform capacity testing? So, um, and actually, that's what this slide gets into. Is, oh. uh, with the omic value, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna want to do that at a minimum annually. I mean, for vented lead acid, definitely you're gonna want to do that annually, and for the um, valve regulated lead acid, you're gonna want to do that quarterly. Um, but for vented lead acid batteries, you're going to want to do the test within the first two years of service, and then you'll want to continue to do tests every. 25% uh, of the of the expected life. So the interesting thing about this is that battery manufacturers will might say that this is a 30 year battery, but you're not necessarily going to get 30 years of life out of it. So you have to take into consideration the amount of life you realistically expect to get out of it, which might be 20 years. So if I do 25% of that, then that's going to be um, every every five years I'm going to be doing a test. So I gave an example here where if it's based on a 16-year life expectancy, I'm going to do every four years. Now for valve-regulated lead-acid batteries, it's not to exceed 25% or two years, whichever is less. And that, again, goes back to the stability of these types of batteries. They're not as stable as your, as your flooded cells, so they have typically a less a lower life expectancy. Um, hopefully that answered the question. Um, okay, and then um, what what would be the best way to test AC ripple? The AC ripple, um, so there's actually two different quantities that, that you can look at. There's AC ripple current and there's AC ripple voltage. Um, with AC ripple voltage, you can just get a, a simple voltmeter. So it's not that not that difficult. With AC ripple current, um, that's actually not too challenging either. It's, uh, especially for us, we actually our our bite testers actually do that measurement for you, um, both the bite three and the bite two. Uh, one with the CT clamp, one by uh, going onto one of the straps and just measuring it. But you but generally speaking, what you need is you need an AC ammeter and and some sort of clamp or some sort of way to get into the circuit or into the series path of the of the battery stream. Great. Okay. Okay. Now, um, we've pretty much covered all this slide. However, there's one other important part at the bottom where it talks about annual testing, which is recommended. So you have your normal recommendations of 25% of life or two years for whichever is less for the VRLA, but if you start seeing signs of degradation, then you will want to test on an annual basis. And, and the, the break point is right around the 85% of life, of, uh, of expected life. Oops, sorry. Okay. Now there are some conditions that need to be met based on doing an acceptance or a performance test and you're going to follow these um, these steps as well you're going to follow them for the service and the modified performance test with the exception of one, item number one where we you you'll want to equalize the battery and then return it to float for a minimum of 72 hours prior to the test but just remember the service test and the modified performance test, they're in the as found condition, so we do not equalize. But the rest of the measurements still apply where you're going to go through and make sure that your your 
battery connections and your your strap resistance measurements are, are adequate so that you get the most uh, realistic test. Um, you can record your float voltages and currents and your electrolyte levels if you're using Bennett lead acid of at least 10% of the cells. Your, your terminal uh, foot voltage as well, when we get to BRLA, we're going to want to do the ohmic values. And I need to take any other necessary precautions, whether it's isolating the battery from load or isolating it from a parallel battery string or something of that nature so I don't jeopardize my system or any equipment that may still be relying upon the battery. Now, some of the effects we need to consider, one of the big, the, one of the big things we need to consider is temperature. I mentioned earlier that a battery manufacturer gives the rating of the battery at a certain temperature, which is 25 degrees Celsius or 77 degrees Fahrenheit. As the, as the temperature decreases, my amp hour decreases. So there's a graph here that shows exactly that where at 25 degrees C, I'm at 100% rate of capacity, but as I drop in temperature, my capacity goes down. Whereas if I go up in temperature, my capacity or my amp hour rating goes up. So one might think, well, okay, well, if 77 degrees is good at 100%, maybe I can go to 30 degrees and get 105%. Well, the problem there is that for every 10 degrees C rise or 18 degrees Fahrenheit, rise in temperature, it decreases the battery life by half. So um, the 77 degrees or 25 degrees uh, Celsius is, you know, kind of the ideal point. Um, so any deviations from that 25 degrees Celsius, 77 degrees Fahrenheit has to be uh, adjusted in my capacity calculations. And there's two ways to address that. There's a time-adjusted method, and there's a rate-adjusted method. And we'll talk about that next. Oh, sorry, one second. Okay. The time-adjusted method is recommended for your acceptance tests, your modified performance, and your performance tests with a duration of one hour or greater. So for most substation applications, generation battery applications, that you're going to be doing a minimum of a one hour test in most of those situations. So you're going to use this method. Some of the UPS applications, you might, you might use a rate adjusted method, which we'll talk about in a minute. But you do not, you'll choose the test current based on the manufacturer recommendations, and you're not going to make any adjustments to the test current. What you're going to do is you're going to adjust the capacity. So this, this, I have my calculation down here to calculate percent capacity. And what it is is this TS is the, is say I was doing a one-hour test, I would look at the battery manufacturer's discharge rate schedule, and it'll, it'll give me the, that specified rate for that specified amount of time. So this is the time portion related to, to whatever current I'm going to be doing. And then this is the actual measured time, TA. And then I'm going to apply a temperature value, multiply that by 100, and that's going to give me my percent rated capacity at 25 degrees C. And <clears throat> this is the values, and you'll notice that at 25 degrees C, obviously my correction value is 1. I don't need to do any temperature correction. So I'll just basically do the time that the battery discharged divided by the time it was specified to discharge. Um, if I go down in temperature, you'll see my, my temperature corrections are going down. And then if I go up in temperature, you see they're going up. Now, the rate-adjusted method is for a performance or an acceptance test of one hour or less. And typically, these are going to be your UPS applications, like, for example, maybe in a data center or something of that nature. 
Now, this discharge rate, you can do it one of two ways. You can either simulate an end-of-life condition based on some sort of aging factor. Um, basically, what an aging factor is, is whenever an uh, engineer is designing a battery, <clears throat> they're designing it to last so long, so they put in, they actually oversize the batteries in the beginning so that once it reaches that end-of-life schedule, um, it's able to supply the uh, amount of load for the exact amount of time that I want. So they, they call that an aging factor. <clears throat> so you can simulate an end of life based on the aging condition, or you can actually run it at the full publish rate. So for example, if, if the battery manufacturer said, run this test for 30 minutes at, you know, 200 amps, then that's what you're going to do. Whereas if you're simulating an end of life, uh, condition, it might be 180 amps instead of 200. Um, the only other time you adjust the, the rate of current is if the temperature range is outside of 15 degrees Celsius or 35 uh, to 35 degrees Celsius. Um, as long as it's within there, you don't do anything else with the rate, uh, the test current rate. And my, cal my calculation, you'll see it changed a little bit. Instead of the temperature correction portion being in the divisor, uh, being in the bottom portion, now it's on the top, where I have my actual rate uh, of, and instead of being time this time, now it's actually current. And, and then I have my publish, um, what the publish rating is. Got my temperature correction, multiply that by 100, and that gives me my my percent capacity. And you'll notice that it, the first one had KT as the reference, and now this one has KC, and it is a completely different table. You cannot, you cannot interchange the two, so it's important to make sure you choose the right table for the right method. And you'll also notice that obviously 25 degrees C, I'm at 1, if I go up in temperature, now my values are going down instead of going up like before. And if I go down in temperature, my values are going uh, up. Now, one of the biggest questions I always get when it comes to capacity testing is, is this a destructive test? And no, it's not a destructive test. It doesn't destroy the batteries. Now, it is a consumptive test. It does consume some of consume some of the life of the battery. One of the, there are a couple terms that I want to introduce to you. One is called depth of dis discharge. And this is equal to how deeply a battery is discharged. So, for example, the, kind of think of it as the opposite of a charge state. If you look on your phone and you have it plugged in, you know, it might say 90% charged or 80% or 100% charged. Well, if I'm at 100% charge, that means I'm 0% discharged. Whereas if I took, say, 10 amp hours, or I, I consumed 10 amp hours out of a 100 amp hour battery, now I'm at a 10% depth of discharge or a 90% charge state. Now, this is important because battery manufacturers will say that their batteries are designed for so many cycles, and a cycle is defined as one complete period of discharge and recharge. Now, the other interesting thing is that not necessarily 100% charge is considered a cycle. You have to look at the battery manufacturer. Typically, around 80% depth of discharge is considered one cycle. And these are just some samples here where vinylate acid might have 20 deep discharge cycles. They, are, they, they don't like to be cycled quite as much as a valve regulated lead acid where I found an example where one said it claimed to have 1,600 deep discharge cycles available. Now, so let's go through an example on that depth on the depth of discharge. So I have a 50 amp hour battery, and my load profile requires 24 amp hours. So I need to remove 24 amp hours from this 50 based on my load criteria. So this is an example of a discharge curve, and, and we're not going to look at the minutes. We're going to be looking at the hours. Um, I'm using 1.75 volts per cell at 77 degrees Fahrenheit. I mentioned that battery manufacturers will have 
various different types of uh, volts per cell that you can use. 1.75 is very common. That's probably the most common. But they also might have 1.8, 1.85, or, or various different levels. And that will change these discharge currents here. So then I have my time across the top, how many hours do I want to do. And then it tells me, based on this specific battery, the 50 amp hour battery, what my discharge rates will be. And as I mentioned earlier, they typically will rate the batteries for a specified amount of time. So this is an eight hour battery, where if I took eight times 6.3, that's going to give me my 50. Whereas if I cut it in half to four hours, it doesn't double to 12.6, it would actually go to 10.4. That's showing that nonlinear function. Now, scenario one, to get this to do this test, let's say I chose the one hour rate of 25 and a half amps. So I removed 25 and a half amps from the battery, my depth of discharge is only 51%. Scenario two, I, d I say, all right, I want to use the three-hour rate, which give, which then removes, I have to do 12.9 amps, and that removes 38.7 amp hours from the battery. And I have to take the 38.7 amp hours divided by the 50 amp hour capacity. I'm now 77.4% uh, depth of discharge. Now, what I'll say is both tests are valid. But as you can see, the one hour rate is less consumptive in nature. So I'm not quite, I'm using about a half of a cycle versus um, three quarters of a cycle. Now, the, another effect to consider is what's called cell reversal. That's when one cell, instead of being in the right polarity, it actually switches polarity instead of supplying load, it, instead of supplying capacity is now actually becoming a load on the battery string which makes which means that the battery string is not going to last as long as I wanted it to so a uh, sale is considered to be approaching cell reversal when you reach one volt or below um, if you reach that if you reach that point on a particular cell and you still got some time to go on your test then you should bypass that cell now when you're bypassing a cell, you have a maximum of 10% of the test time for six minutes, whichever is less. Um, and so it's, a, it's basically uh, for a one hour test, you have six minutes and for a two hour test, you have six minutes. But if you're on a 30 minute test, then you only have three minutes to swap that, that uh, battery string uh, to, to bypass that, that, that cell. The other thing to note is you only allowed one pause during the test. So if, if you stopped it halfway, bypassed a few cells, and then uh, three quarters of the way into the test, you have some more cells you need to bypass. Well, then that that that's a non-passing test. You, you're not allowed to pause more than once. Now the important thing is that once you bypass a cell, you need then need to recalculate what's going to be your stop condition of the voltage. So for example, if I started with 60 cells, but then I uh, and I had a stop in voltage of 105 volts, now 59 cells is going to be 103.25. So now we get into some of the aspects of the test design. Um, there's another guide called IEEE 485. Presumably most everyone's familiar with this. This is how you, these are some of the parameters that you need with regards to sizing uh, a lead acid battery. And there, they'll ask things, you'll consider things such as the application being switch gear generation, data center, uh, what te type of temperature the battery is going to see, what are, what's the end voltage or the minimum volts per cell that I need, uh, what design margin I'm going to incorporate and so I can account for potential site growth, and what kind of aging factor am I going to use. All of these are basically designed to oversize the battery so that when it reaches end of life or it's nearing the end of life, you still have enough capacity. So from the from a engineer, I will then receive you know something like what's shown here. I'll have my sizing parameters, which had all the information from the IEEE 45 guide, as well as what my load profile is. Now, some info for consideration on this is I see I have my minimum volts, my minimum voltage of 1.75 volts per cell, so that's what I'm going to, I'm going to need that for my test criteria. 
I also have my anthar required <clears throat> based on this information in this in my load profile. I have period one of one minutes at 100 amps, and then 239 minutes at 18 amps. And admittedly, this is a very simplified uh, load profile. Yours might be more complex than this, but I just wanted to give an example. So to calculate the amount of amp hours required, I'm going to convert this time into an hour basis. So I need to divide the 1 by 60 and then multiply that by the current. As well, I need to convert this into hour basis, period 2. So I take my 239 divided by 60 and multiply that by my 18 amps, and that gives me that I need 73.37 amp hours of, of capacity for this battery. I also have my maximum current. I'll need that for a particular test. I have my total time duration of four hours, and then I also have my aging factor of 1.25. So for this particular test, I'm assuming we made the assumption based on the design that we determined 150 amp hour uh, uh, battery would, would be sufficient for my needs. So if I'm looking at an acceptance or a performance test, uh, I need the 73.37 amp hours, so I can take the one hour rate and see and see that that's going to provide me 76 and a half amp hours, which will verify that I'll be able to get the 73 amp hours that I need out. And I see that I get a 51 percent depth of discharge, so I've used about half of a half of a charge cycle. When I look at a service test, again, remember this is in an as-found condition, and it's just based on the ability to meet the load. So I'm going to follow the load profile exactly of one minute at 100 amps and then 239 minutes at 18 amps and I've already calculated the 73.37 amp hours and that's a 48.9 percent or roughly half of a uh, depth of discharge so half of a cycle. Now if I do a modified performance test this one gets a little bit more complex. The first thing I have to do is um, have to figure out I have to figure out the amount of test duration that I need. And I don't actually do the four hours. What I do is I take into consideration the aging margin um, that I use in the design criteria. So that means I need to take the four hour duration times 1.25, and I'm going to do a test of five hours. Additionally, I need to test the critical period of this, which is the 100 amps. So I need to do one minute at 100 amps. And then I need to do the published rate uh, for the five-hour test, which if I look down here is 26.4 amps. Um, so that's what I do for the other 299 minutes of that five-hour test is the 26.4. Now that's obviously very consumptive, 133.2 uh, amp hours, and I get an 88.9% depth of discharge. So I've used one cycle in that test. Now, I'll mention this is just one variation of the modified performance test. There's at least one other variation, and you'll see Annex I of IEEE 450 for other methods if you don't have this simple of a load profile. Now, looking at some sample test results, what I have here is on my x-axis. This is time, and this is pulled from uh, the software that we use called PowerDB. And then on this axis, I actually have my voltage, the y-axis on the left-hand side, and the y-axis on the right-hand side I actually have my capacity in amp hours. So this black curve here is my voltage. So this is the beginning of my test, and then there's a phenomenon called coup de foie, which basically it means that it literally means crack of the whip, but you get, you come down and you reach some minimum voltage and then it climbs back up and then it's fairly stable until you get out and then it starts dropping uh, very quickly. So that's my voltage graph and then the blue graph, uh, the blue line is my capacity rated in amp hours over, over on this axis. These solid lines are different warning and stop limits uh, based on capacity or based, based on voltage. <clears throat> 
And then you'll also see that we get our measured battery capacity. This was not done at 25 degrees C, so we had the temperature correction, which, which the software does automatically for you, as well it automatically calculates the percent capacity. So this was the actual discharge time, an hour, 20 minutes, and 19 seconds. So that may have been based on a one and a half hour uh, rate. Uh, passing, as I mentioned, is typically considered to be 80%. So this would be a successful test. <clears throat> now how we do this, we have a, a load unit that we call the torquel, and that unit will connect across the entire battery string with, uh, with the dotted lines being the voltage measurement that you'll, that you'll have. This picture on the right hand side is uh, the first page of the form that you would use where you can put in all the nameplate data of, of the manufacturer, um, what type of temperature correction method are you going to use, and then what kind of test currents I'm going to put in, what my end voltage are, what time duration, and then what my warning and stop limits are going to be based on voltage or capacity or time. Now, while this is great, there's one critical element missing, and that's the individual cells. So as I mentioned, the torque is across the whole entire battery string. So what we have to incorporate are the battery voltage monitors. Um, and these will monitor each individual cell. The way ours is designed is you connect onto the negative terminal of each battery until you get to the final one and then you connect on to the negative and positive. So you're reading the voltage between these two, which is also taken into account any voltage drop that may be occurring across this strap. Um, <clears throat> all of these then get connected back to the computer, which is con and the torque is also, or the load tester is also connected back to the computer. So you get your individual cell monitoring as well. And this is an example of what it would look like. This is just showing four cells where the black bars or the grayish colored bars are my initial conditions and the green colors are my condition of, of that specific cell. And I can also set up warning and stop limits with the dotted red line being warning and the solid red line being, being stopped. As well, we provide tables of what the values, where they started, what the current value is, and you also have some history in there. Okay. Now, as a final... Before we move on, yeah. can we yeah. fill a couple of questions? Um, there seems to be some confusion about the depth of discharge cycle. So earlier you said something like 51% is about half a cycle. So does that mean half a cycle is 100% or 80% like you mentioned earlier? It's, it's, actually based on, it, it's actually based on what the manufacturer says is it defines as a complete cycle. Um, one, one manufacturer might say 80% is considered a full, full cycle, 80% depth of discharge. So in that instance, yes, 50% would not be half. It'd be about 60% of a cycle or give or take. Um, Whereas if, if a manufacturer said 100% uh, depth of discharge is, is you know, considered a cycle, then yes, the 51% would be half of the cycle. Okay. And then so if a battery has four times 20% depth of discharge, would that equal to one full cycle? If the battery has four times 20%, I'm not sure, I'm not sure I understand the question. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't know, maybe the, maybe uh, I'll see if they elaborate in the chat a bit later. And then okay. there are, there were some correction tables, uh, I think a few slides ago. Are these from the IEEE 450 standard? Yes, they're from, they're from, they're, they're contained in both the IEEE 450 as well as the IEEE 1188. Um, 450 is for the vented lead acid or flooded cells, and, and 1188 is for the um, valve regulated lead acid. I also forgot to mention we're not we're not really talking about NICAD 
batteries. There might be some users of NICAD batteries out there. Um, that guide is IEEE 1106. But yes, the, the two tables are, are contained in both of those um, guides, IEEE guides. Okay, thank you. I think uh, we'll move on and save all the questions for the end of the presentation. Okay. So uh, again, this is not an in-depth NERC review. Um, just wanted to highlight a couple of things. Obviously, the, the NERC is for basically anybody touching the transmission grid, so transmission owners, generation owners, distribution providers. And the current standard that applies to battery testing and maintenance is PRC005-2. You can just do a, a Google search for PRC005-2, and it'll, it'll pop up. But it's on the NERC website, and it's uh, the title is Transmission and Generation Protection System Maintenance and Testing. Now, there are two tables within there that pertain to batteries. Table 1-4A is for vented lead acid batteries, as, as boxed out at the top. And you'll notice that part of that as part of that, they have essentially three different boxes for three different testing intervals, depending on what you're doing. Um, and they define it as a maximum test interval, as opposed to do this monthly, do this quarterly. They, they only define the maximum interval allowable. So for calendar months, you're going to do some of the similar things that you would do on almost on a monthly or quarterly basis in, in IEEE. And then 18 calendar months, you're going to do things that are typically specified within a quarterly or annual basis for IEEE. Now, the one part I did want to point out, they do expect, uh, unlike in the IEEE guide, where cell ohmic values were optional uh, for vented lead acid batteries, and the NERC standard uh, or guidelines dictate that you're either going to do cell measurements, cell ohmic measures, every 18 months, or as I have boxed out, you're going to do a capacity test, a maximum every six calendar years. Now, the valve-regulated lead-acid batteries is table 1-4B, and it's very similar, but you'll notice that there are some more, free, there's a four-month category, but there's also a six-month category. And, unlike with the uh, vented lead acid. So again, that, that all goes back to my statement of these tend to be less stable. <clears throat> Where you're going to do, they're going to want you to do the cell ohmic values every six months, or you're going to do a capacity test every three calendar years versus six for the vented lead acid. Now just a quick uh, compare and contrast. As I mentioned, up to four months between more or less visual inspections required by NERT, whereas IEEE recommends monthly visual inspections. You're up to six months for VRLA and 18 months for vented lead acid between your ohmic tests, whereas IEEE recommends quarterly, so twice as frequent for VRLA and annual one and a half times as frequent for, for vented lead acid batteries. Your NERC requirements for capacity, uh, if you opt to do that instead of the ohmic test, you're looking at three years for VRLA and six years between uh, six years for vented lead acid, whereas IEEE recommends you do once a performance test once in the first two years, and then you don't exceed 25% of the life. Again, there are manufacturers that rate batteries maybe 30 years, but I personally would not design based on a 30-year 30, 30 life. You might design based on a 20-year or 15-year. So 25% of life is going to be less than the six years. And re keep in mind also that if it's VRLA, they're, they're recommending a maximum of two years. So the other part to keep in mind is that one is a legal standard that they're using as guidelines for possibly imposing fines, whereas one is a maintenance standard. And so they, the, the design of the legal standard is not as aggressive as the IEEE recommendations. And it's, 
it's my opinion that the IEEE recommendations should be followed more closely because you'll, if you're following IEEE recommendations, you're going to meet the NERC requirements, but you're also going to have a better likelihood of finding problems before they become serious. So in summary, as we mentioned, batteries are to, the function is to support a load. And so with the desire to support a load, the only method to accurately determine the ability to support the load is doing capacity testing. Generally speaking, you're going to want to do uh, capacity testing within the first two years, then no more of 25% of life expectancy and not to exceed two years for VRLA. We need to take into account the effects temperature plays on the capacity and how we, how we handle that with our calculations. One, we, as we're designing the test program, we want to minimize the amount of the depth of discharge so we're, we're not consuming as much of the, of the battery life or the number of cycles uh, as we're doing this test. Generally speaking, 80% of capacity is, is the minimum requirement for, for passing condition. And just remember that if you have historically only been using NERC as your guideline, it's a less frequent testing frequency than, than the IEEE recommendations. This is uh, the test equipment that MEGR has to help you in your in, the, in implementing such a program, we have our torque on the left-hand side, which is our capacity or load box. Uh, it's our capacity tester. Then we have our BVMs or battery voltage monitors for your individual cell monitoring. As well, we have the we offer the hydrometer for your specific gravity and temperature measurements. And all of those test instruments are con are consolidated into. Uh, the, or at least the collection of the data is consolidated into what we call PowerDB, our data collection software. This is all the contact information we have, and Year might talk about the webinar survey, but the one thing I do want to point out is we also have a battery testing guide to, that gives you some, some valuable information that can be downloaded from our website. And that concludes everything I prepared for the presentation unless there are additional questions.